Mr. Wright, don't, when I've done these talks before, people have come and done slides or something, pictures of his wife and things, but all that stuff is in the book. So uh, I want to thank uh, Gloria called me. She tracked me down this summer. She found me. I haven't talked about Douglas for a couple of years. And at first, I hesitated. I said, well, let me think about it. Then I called back and said, okay, I'll do it. And uh, and she turned me over to, to Ginny, who's been great setting this up tonight. So uh, I always tell people, I'm, I don't pose to be an expert in Frederick Douglass, but I am someone who spent a couple of years after I retired, a couple of years researching his time in Lynn. And uh, because my memory's failing, mm -hmm. I will occasionally, I will refer to notes I've got here. I'm doing this a little differently today, but the, uh, I don't know how many people know Frederick Douglass. I always assume people do, and that's not a good thing to do. He, he's been more in the news recently, but he was, he was born in 1818. He dies in 1895, so he's 77 years old. So his, his life really spanned the 19th century. And he is considered the most important African-American of the 19th century, the most influential. He, uh, the, it was a recent uh, biography Douglas came out two years ago where they called him the uh, the most famous black man in the world for quite a while in the 19th century. Uh, he was sort of the, the Martin Luther King of that century, if you can picture it that way. And, and the, uh, but after Douglas died, he was kind of forgotten. Uh, they, they stopped publishing his books. He wrote three autobiographies at different points in his life. And uh, he actually was left out of those uh, history of abolition written that never mentioned him. Mm -hmm. And they sort of forgot about Douglas. And so around the middle of the 20th century, in the, around the, in the 50s, a couple of historians started writing about Douglas and putting together copies of his speeches. And the interest in Douglas built, and it culminated really two years ago in 2018 was the, the bicentennial 200th anniversary of his birth. And there were, we call them celebration, but events around the country, particularly at colleges and universities. There were symposiums and lectures about Douglas. And in the places where he lived, there were uh, quite a few events. For example, he lived, he was a slave in Maryland, and then New Bedford he lived, lived in Rochester, New York, and Washington, D.C., and also Lynn. And in Lynn, a, uh, there was a citizens committee, really with not too much help from the outside, a citizens committee that put this all together and did about a dozen events. And I separately was working on this, uh, this little book. I used to be on the board of the Lynn Historical Society, and I, uh, uh, was aware from those days how that some of the information they had was was not complete. So, uh, but anyhow, I, they, the Douglas Community found out I was doing this, so they made they made me one of their events. You know, so I wasn't really planning on that. But uh, I wanted to read two. Uh, oh, I know what I want to say. T today, this culmination is is still growing because I noticed uh, uh, I, I, in 2018 there was a, a Yale historian, David Blight, who wrote what is considered the great biography of Douglas now. He won the Pulitzer Prize. If you have energy, it's about 900 pages, but it's very, very good. It is, he has, David Blight has studied Douglas his whole life. The, uh, last spring, the Obamas, Michelle and Barack Obama, announced they're going to produce a feature film on Douglas. Mm. There was one of them in the theaters recently on Harriet Tubman, just called Harriet. Oh, yes. She also was a slave from Maryland, but the uh, so I was really interested to see the, the Obamas, are, and they're going to base it on Blake's book. Mm. And then I saw the news this week on Monday at the Maryland State House. The, they unveiled a statue, a full life-size statue of Douglas and also of Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the interest in Douglas keeps building and building. Mm -hmm. I wanted to read you just these two quotes jumped out at me when I was researching things. The uh, when he died, in 1895, February 20th. Almost every newspaper in the country covered stories, and most of them were on the front page. That's how big a deal he was then. And this, and one story, I, one article I saw in a paper in Rochester, New York, said this about Douglas. They called him the greatest colored man that America has produced, a man whose life it never will be possible to duplicate in the United States. And uh, probably because he rises, as we will see, from slavery to great heights. Then I, and, and when, when Blight's book came out in 2018, the New Yorker magazine did a, did a review of the book, and they ended with a sentence about Douglas that was very similar to that quote in the, in the paper after he died. They, they wrote, uh, this, is, this, is a, this is Douglas they're speaking of, 
In his legacy as prophetic radical and political pragmatist, in the almost unimaginable bravery of his early journey and the resilience of his later career, in his achievements as a writer, activist, crusader, intellectual, father, and man, the claim that Frederick Douglass was the greatest figure that America has ever produced seems hard to challenge. Now, that may be overstatement, but it, 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 Douglas does rank up there, and oftentimes he's, he's handled only in black history courses or black history, what that kind of thing, but he really is a major figure in American history, not just in American black history. So, the, uh, Now I'm going to tell you what I'm not going to talk about. What I should have said to start, too, so is this is a, a smaller group. I just want to keep it informal, so at any point, Anybody has a question, just put your hand up or yell at me, and, and, uh, and uh, I will try to answer it. I, I don't pretend I'm an expert on, on his whole life. I've certainly read a lot about his whole life, but uh, these are sort of some of the highlights of Douglas's life. He's a slave, born in 1818 for 20 years. He's on a plantation in Maryland, and he's a slave there. So if you want to ask about that, I'll try to answer that. He, uh, his family, he was married to a free black woman named Anna Murray. They had five children. And later in his life, when he was quite an old man, he married a white woman named Helen Pitts. And it was very controversial with her family and his kids, and it was quite a, a to-do. Uh, he, after he escaped, the first place he lived was New Bedford. And he was, he was, uh, he'd worked on the ports in, in uh, Baltimore with him as a ship's cocker. So he had a skill and he went to New Bedford because that was the whaling capital of the world. He thought he could get a job, but when he got there, they didn't want a black man taking a skilled job on the waterfront. So he really was a laborer for, for three years in New Bedford. He was uh, when he, in Rochester, New York, after him skipping Lynn, but in Rochester, New York, where he moved after Lynn, he started a newspaper called the North Star, which became very famous. And he sort of became the voice for the, uh, you know, the three to four million slaves in, in the United States. And, uh, he, uh, he also developed a pretty close relationship with Abraham Lincoln. And uh, in fact, when, when Lincoln was assassinated, his wife gave Douglas his, her husband's favorite walking stick. And uh, he was a, Douglas was a recruiter for the uh, Massachusetts 54th Regiment, which was, if you ever seen the movie Glory with yeah. Denzel Washington, in fact, a couple of his boys were in that. And he was, uh, he had campaigned too for the, uh, there were three big amendments passed at the end of the Civil War, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. And the 13th uh, abolished slavery, and the 14th was an Equal Rights and Citizenship Amendment, and the 15th gave blacks the right to vote. And after the 15th Amendment was passed, there was a huge gathering of African Americans in Baltimore, and they, they passed a resolution stating that the, form, the foremost, calling Douglas the foremost man of color in the times in which we live. The, uh, he went, on, he went on to become president of the Freedmen's Sl Savings Bank, which was set up after the Civil War when, when slaves were coming out and trying to give them a place to save their money. It, it ended in a terrible collapse, but he came on late not knowing that, put a lot of his own money into it that, that he lost. He was a, uh, a campaigner for uh, the Republican Party. When he became close with Lincoln, who was a Republican, the party sort of started around that time. He campaigned for every president almost for the rest of his life. Was a Republican, and he, because of that, he was uh, uh, he got several awards. I mean, awards the jobs. He was named United States Marshal of the District of Columbia, which was the highest uh, I think job in the country at that point in, in our history for a, a black man. He later became Register of Deeds for Washington D.C. and he was Minister to Haiti, which was sort of the equivalent of, of an ambassador. He was the first African-American nominated for vice president. Mm -hmm. He was the first African-American to have his name placed in nomination for president by a major party. That was the Republican Party in 1988. I mean, 1888. The, uh, the thing that gets me, when, when you look at the tra trajectory of his life, when he starts as a little boy, as, as a slave, he is uh, living in his master's house and sleeping in a closet off the kitchen. And in, in, the, uh, in the winter, when it got, gets cold, he would crawl inside a, a burlap feed bag to stay warm. Now that, that same little boy ends his life in Cedar Hill, which is a, a large house on a hill 
in Washington, D.C., overlooking the uh, Capitol and the Washington Monument. Mm -hmm. He had 13 acres. Mm -hmm. He had a library with, uh, mm -hmm. he had, it, it, the, we, we visited, my wife and I visited the house this last, last spring, and he's got books there by Shakespeare and Dickens and Marcus Aurelius, and unlike most of us, he read the books and remembered what he read. He would, <laughs> he would write letters and actually quote almost exactly from, uh, from books he'd read. And he was a huge fan of uh, Robert Burns, a Scottish poet, and he was quite, quite an intellectual. So, the, uh, My own involvement with uh, Douglas, uh, I, I was a, spent my so-called career as, as a, re a reporter and columnist for newspapers, and I was working at the Lynn Item in 1990, covering the city of Lynn for them. And uh, I got a phone call from a man named Vincent P. O'Brien, who was a retired editor and very erudite. And I never met him, but he, he called up and he said to me, are you watching Ken Burns' documentary on the Civil War on TV? And I said, I was a little bit. And he said, well, do you know that Frederick Douglass is featured quite prominently in it? In fact, he said, Morgan Freeman is doing his voice. And I said, well, I didn't know that. And he said, did you know that Douglass used to live in Lynn? And I said, I had no idea. And so he said that might make a good story. So I sort of got an assignment from a retired <laughs> editor to do it. And I did several stories using whatever resources I could find in, in Lynn at the library and the historical society. But it was, uh, they didn't have much then. That's when I realized, <coughs> excuse me, there was very little. And, and after leaving Lynn, I read a lot of, I started reading books on Douglas, and I realized. A lot of what Lynn had was not accurate. They even have a monument in the wrong dates for, for, for Douglas, you know, and it's just, uh, but, but Lynn is, is a challenge because Douglas came there. He he's a, he's, lives in New Bedford for three years. In New Bedford, he's a lay preacher. He's very active in black abolition groups and speaks, and a white man hears him speak at a meeting and invites him to come to Nantucket where the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society was having its annual convention. And he went there, they went on for three days, and he was very nervous, and he sat there, and he'd never spoken before white people, and they finally got him to stand up and speak, and they were so impressed that, that the people who headed the society, William Lloyd Garrison and others, hired him on the spot to be an agent or traveling, traveling lecturer. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm finding a call here. So he, he probably had no idea what that job was. He'd never heard of it, but he said, I'll do it on a trial basis. And that's what brought him to Lynn. And I think there were some prominent abolitionists from Lynn who were at the meeting. Lynn was a safe city to move to. It was, uh, there were a lot of abolitionists and Quakers, and it was close to Boston, which is where the uh, State Society was, where the Liberator, the famous abolition newspaper was. So he came to Lynn in around August of 1841, excuse me. <coughs> The, uh, so I just go back to Lynn for one second. I was just, uh, um, so when Douglas comes as an agent, he, that was a job that put him on the road all the time. He traveled and traveled and traveled across Massachusetts and New England, out to Indiana and Pennsylvania. He went to Great Britain for 19 months. So I actually sat down and calculated the days and of the six years he lived in Lynn, two thirds of the time, <coughs> He was actually away, so it's one of the reasons not much about it is known about his time in Lynn. He also barely mentions Lynn in his uh, three autobiographies. He also barely mentions his own family. It was just what he wasn't going to write about that. And uh, so what I start, decided to do was I said, well, I'll try to put together what really was just going to be a, a report for the for the Lynn Historical Society, and I uh, it turned into this little book. And I decided I wouldn't quote other historians or try to write something myself. I would just base it on primary sources. So I would, I read more than 100 letters by Douglas, many letters to Douglas by other people, journals written by uh, contemporaries. I went to the, uh, the Lynn Library is not in great shape. They haven't put a lot of money into it, but I found in their files upstairs they have microfilm mm. from newspapers from the 1840s. So mm. for me it was a treasure. Yeah. But working an old microfilm machine, I was going to request an air sickness bag next to me because uh, after a while your your head is just spinning, you know. But uh, 
And then I also, the, the Liberator, the newspaper I mentioned that was edited by William Lloyd Garrison, that was the State Society's newspaper. Douglas is working for them, so they followed his every move for all those years. So you, you saw where he was going to speak. I mean, a speaking schedule you wouldn't believe. He spoke one time, I think it was April 1842, he spoke more than 30 times in a month. You can't believe how rigorous their life was, and he was, uh, so, um, anyhow, reading through that was probably the best source I had because uh, every movement of Douglas was what I could follow during the years he lived in Lynn, so. The, uh, I thought one thing I'd do is, is uh, I just saw this the other day, sometimes when I go to talks, the next day I, I don't remember a thing, you know, I say, what the heck did he talk about? So. I'm going to give you three facts that maybe will stick with you. Here's number one. Frederick Douglass' birthday is tomorrow. It's Valentine's Day. But the, uh, the truth is, that was his official birthday. The truth is no slave knows when they're born. No slave knows their birthday. But he was told when he was a little boy that his mother called him her Valentine. So he, uh, he just told, took that as his birthday, February 14th. The other thing, which is hard for me to do this part almost because he was he had a black mother and a, and a white father his mother was a slave and his father was probably a slave master but he never knew and no one's ever figured out who his father was you think with DNA tests they could figure it out but they haven't yet and his mother, yet. no and his mother lived at a plantation 12 miles away and that's what they did that as you know they split up slave families and she when she could would come in the night to see her little boy, who at that point was living with his grandmother out in the woods in a, in a, in a small hut. And uh, she would either walk or, I really don't know how she got there, but when she finished her day's work, she would come, maybe she got a ride in a horse or coach, and she would uh, crawl into bed with him in the night and then leave in the morning before the uh, sun came up. So this is the line I have trouble reading because it's uh, anyone who's a parent. In his first autobiography, Douglas wrote, uh, I do not recollect of ever seeing my mother by the light of day. I do not recollect of ever seeing my mother by the light of day. It's hard for any of us to imagine that. The uh, fact number three, Frederick Douglas is not his name. His name is Frederick Bailey. He was, uh, his mother was Harriet Bailey, a slave, and he was Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. And when he escapes, he goes to New York City and is taken in by someone in the Underground Railroad, and they say, you can't be Frederick Bailey, they're going to come looking for you, we've got to change your name. So they changed the name to Johnson, and he was Frederick Johnson for about three, two weeks. And they sent, they sent him to New Bedford, to the house of a man named Nathan Johnson, who was a very prominent abolitionist. New Bedford had a large black community because of the shipbuilding, they, people could get a job as mariners on those ships, so uh, Nathan Johnson said to him, I'm Johnson, my wife is Johnson, our kids are Johnson, half the people here are Johnson. You gotta be something else. And Nathan Johnson, I love to hear these things because you, it changes your, we have such a narrow view of history. Mm -hmm. Nathan Johnson at the time was reading uh, Lady of the Lake, a narrative poem by Sir Walter Scott, which tells you a lot about Nathan Johnson. And in it was a character named Douglas, so he said, let's make you Frederick Douglas. So Douglas took the name and then just on his own, added an S, I think. So he has two S's on Douglas, so just for flair. <laughs> the, uh, so Frederick Douglas has, uh, came to Lynn when he, when he was 23 years old. And the, uh, once when I spoke to the Lynn Museum, my son came out from New York with his wife, and they were, uh, he had really, my son's a designer. He put this together. He got it independently published. I wasn't going to do any of that, but he did it. So. But he came all the way out to hear me speak, and I saw him, so I figured, here's a chance to take a cheap shot at him. So uh, after saying that Douglas is 23 when he comes to uh, Lynn, and has he's just started this amazing job, has a wife, two children, and a third child on the way, and I looked at my son, and I said, when my son was 23, he was living in our basement, yelling upstairs for his mother to make him a bologna sandwich. <laughs> It wasn't really true, but he laughed, you know, so he, he knows. The, uh, when you were an agent for the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, you had a very hard job. You traveled 
hundreds and thousands of miles. And as I said, you gave sometimes two speeches a day. You traveled by train and steamboat and barge and carriage and coach and sleigh and on horseback. As an elderly man, Douglas wrote a letter once saying, I've got to stop riding all night on horseback. It's killing me. You know, it's too much. And, uh, and for the agents, there were probably about a dozen at that point, many of them former ministers. But for Douglas, he was the, uh, they, they had never had a uh, fugitive slave as an agent or speaking for them, but he wasn't allowed inside most of the coaches, so he would have to ride on top, even in horrible weather. Mm. He would have to, on you know, steamboats, he'd have to ride on the deck of a steamboat in horrible weather, and sometimes other abolitionists would join him. But then he would get to a town and uh, to uh, speak, and the doors would be locked everywhere because there's such a, some people in the country were anti-slavery. That's not the same as abolitionist. And the, and the, the group that followed Garrison were real radicals. <coughs> they, were, uh, they wanted to split the country in half. They believed in disunion. They thought the Constitution was a pro-slavery document because of some things in the Constitution. They attacked Christian churches and ministers as thieves and murderers because they had and hypocrites because they still had segregated pews in the churches and most of the churches up north still had close relationships with churches in the south that were supporting slavery. <coughs> and Douglas actually was devoutly religious and Christian. But uh, so when they went to towns, nobody opened their doors. And he one time went through a town ringing a bell to get a crowd to hear him. But uh, he also had, uh, he would face, they all faced uh, jeering crowds. You know, a lot of support, but also jeering crowds and people throwing things. And once he was beaten badly in, in Pendleton, Indiana with a, with a club, and a whole group came out of the, they were speaking in the woods, I mean, out in a field because they couldn't get any other place. And a group of men came out of the woods and Douglas was clubbed badly. So it was a very, uh, you talk about, and then they got horrible pay. So you talk about a bad job, you know, it was really, <coughs> they were so courageous. It's amazing to read the lives of these, uh, these abolitionists who traveled like that. The, uh, when Douglas, uh, I also thought about this, you know, he, came, he comes to Lynn as a fugitive slave and you think you like to keep a low profile. And his black friends in New Bedford said, don't take that job as a speaker. Why would you want to get up, let people look at you and maybe someone's going to recognize you. Why would you put your whole life and your family's life at stake? But he did it anyways. And, uh, but in Lynn, he'd only been in Lynn a couple of weeks when uh, it was a Tuesday morning, uh, September 28th, 1841, he went down to the Lynn Depot, the train depot, to get on a train to ride to Newburyport with other abolitionists that were going to a meeting. And as soon as he gets on the train in Lynn, the conductor came up to him and said, uh, you're out of here, you've got to go to the, I think the front car was the Jim Crow car, the segregated car that was filthy, with broken windows, and smoke was <coughs> pouring. And Douglas said, uh, fine here. No, I'm very comfortable here. And the other abolitionist said, you know, why does he have to move? And Douglas kept saying, why do you want me to move? And finally the conductor blurted out, because you're black. And then he grabbed Douglas to try to yank him out. But Douglas, I think you can't quite tell from this, but he's always described as powerfully built, like a football player, like a linebacker. And this little conductor couldn't move him, so he yelled for train workers to come. And about six men poured under the train, grabbed Douglas and the man next to him, was also a white man, but he was resisting. And they carried them both off the train and threw them onto the platform. And they were both injured, but not, not terribly. But it was, uh, what would intrigue me when I was going through Lynn newspapers. I'm thinking of Douglas, he was, he was only in Lynn a few days. He was already in the, in the news. They did a story on it. This is the Lynn Record, September 29, 1841. Uh, and this is a reform, a reform paper that supported abolitionists. Another outrage on the Eastern Railroad against liberty and equal rights was perpetrated near the Lynn Depot yesterday morning. A well-looking, well-behaved young man, slightly colored, by the name of Douglas, took a seat in the first train of cars for New Report with John A. Collins and several rough men, if not ruffians, in the employ of the company collected together and seizing hold of Douglas, dragged him out by brute force. The, uh, Douglas talked about this incident a lot in the rest of his career, in his speeches, and he wrote about it in his autobiographies. In, in, in Lynn at that time, there were, as, as I said, quite a few abolitionists and Quakers, and they held three 
protest meetings as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And the Eastern Railroad got so upset or worried about what was going to happen in Lynn, they refused to stop the train at the Lynn Depot and they would just go through. Yeah. But Lynn also had a lot of, it was a big shoe town, a lot of prominent businessmen who went to Boston back and forth. So it only lasted the boycott a day, a day or two. But, uh, and then later on, on the, uh, on the train issue, there were three railroads in Massachusetts that had this Jim Crow policy, and the abolitionists went to the legislature, but they didn't do anything. And, but after two years, 1843, under just public pressure, the railroads abandoned, abandoned the Jim Crow policy. So that was some achievement in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Although around the rest of the country, Douglas Space faced it everywhere he went. So uh, the other thing, uh, that September, October, he is, uh, he gave a speech in Lynn that's famous or important because it's the first recorded speech Douglas ever gave. So it's not his first speech, but there was a man from Pennsylvania, a pacifist who was there, who heard a, a fugitive slave was going to speak. He'd never heard one. He couldn't believe the slave is speaking. So he went and he took notes, and he went back to uh, a paper in Philadelphia and had it, had, his, had it printed, had the speech printed. So this is going to be the beginning of it. Because it, it uh, it's interest, it's of interest to historians because here's a man who becomes one of the great orators of the century with Daniel Webster and Lincoln. Douglas is in their class or better, and uh, here's his one of his first little speeches. So he 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 started this way. I feel greatly embarrassed when I attempt to address an audience of white people. I am not used to speak to them, and it makes me tremble when I do so because I have always looked up to them with fear. My friends, I have come to tell you, tell you something about slavery. What I know, it, know of it is I felt it. When I came north, I was astonished to find that the abolitionists knew so much about it. But though they can give you its history, though they can depict its horrors, they cannot speak as I can from experience. They cannot refer you to a back covered with scars as I can, for I have felt these wounds. Yes, my blood has sprung out as the lash embedded itself in my flesh. Then he goes on, he was, this is his little assault on Christianity. He says, and yet my master has expectation of being a pious man and a good Christian. He was a class leader in the Methodist church. I have seen this class leader cross and tie the hands of one of his young female slaves and lash her on the bare skin and justify the deed by the quotation from the Bible. He who knoweth his master's will and doeth it not shall be beaten with many stripes. So... The, uh, so Douglas is traveling in Lynn for uh, three years or so, and he, in addition to everything else he faced, he, a lot of people started, he hear them yell things out about, there's no way you're a slave. There's no way someone this articulate, this brilliant could be a slave. And so after hearing that time after time, in the winter of 1844-45, he retreats to his Lynn home, and he writes a book, Narrative <coughs> of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. And it's considered an American classic. It is taught still in many schools, and uh, it's an amazing book because in it, he reveals his true identity. He said, I'm not Frederick Douglass, I'm Frederick Bailey. And he talked, tells what plantation he's from, and he names an overseer right, by name on the plantation who murdered a slave. He names ministers who beat slaves, female slaves, slaves and whipped them. He names person after person after person, and when he finished it, he handed the book to Wendell Phillips, who was mm. one of the preeminent abolitionists. Mm. And Phillips was very distinguished. He was, the, he was Harvard Law. He was the uh, son of the first mayor of Boston. If you ever go to the Public Garden, there's a statue mm. of Wendell Phillips. you ever seen that? So Phillips read it and thought it was brilliant, but he said, if I were you, I would throw it in the fire. They're mm. going to come get you. Mm. No, you're, you're just baiting them to come get you. So, uh, but Douglas, who was either reckless or courageous, went ahead and published his book. And, but after about two months, he left on a steamboat for Great Britain. He really fled. His, well, he knew his wife and children would be safe. She was a free black woman, and a lot of abolitionists were there to protect her, but he was not. So he, fl he fled to Great Britain. And uh, he, when he got there, it was a, uh, he, he couldn't believe it. They had. You know, the British Empire had abolished slavery years earlier, and uh, his first letter home said, I have a new life. I'm treated like a man. 
I can go anywhere I want. I can do anything I want. People are friendly. His, the interesting part of the trip for me was when he went, he went to Ireland, was his first stop. And he was, uh, they quickly got his book and started, an Irish publisher started publishing the book and he would carry the copies with him and sell them as he went. But he, uh, he dined with the Lord Mayor of Dublin. He went to the home, he, he was hosted by F Father Matthew, who was the famous temperance priest, who was, he'd have all those millions of Irishmen take the pledge in the morning, at night they were drinking again, but, it, uh, <laughs> but I can say that because that's my heritage. The, uh, but he also, he, he saw a poster that uh, announcing that Daniel O'Connell would be speaking uh, and he, uh, Daniel O'Connell, is one of the great figures in Irish history. Uh, he was called the Liberator. He fought for Catholic emancipation and re repeal of the, of the Union with Great Britain. And when Douglas was a boy, he got his hands on a little book called the Columbian Orator. And all it was was speeches, and he read them over and over and over again. And one of the speeches in there was by O'Connell. So I can't imagine his excitement when he sees O'Connell speaking. And O'Connell now is, <coughs> Douglas is uh, young in his mid-twenties, O'Connell's an old man, he's going to die in about a year. And Douglas goes to hear him speak, but he can't get in, the place is just packed. And when O'Connell finally died, they say that 300,000 people came to Dublin. He was a tremendous leader, so, the, um, so Douglas goes there with a, a friend from Lynn who was traveling with him. And they can't get in, and finally there's sort of a break in the crowd, and his friend gets in, and they move their way forward and the friend goes up to the front and finds O'Connell's son and says Frederick Douglass is here and, and they knew of Douglass and so the son went up and told O'Connell that Frederick Douglass was in the audience so O'Connell called Douglass up on stage wow. and uh, wow. introduced him to uh, the audience as the and Douglass never forgot these words and he always talked about it, as the black O'Connell of the United States yeah. And Douglas considered that a great compliment coming from coming from O'Connell. The uh, one thing I want to read you when, when Douglas is in Ireland. If you know Irish history at all, he's there in 1845 and 46. Mm. The famine mm. is on. Mm. A million people die. Millions leave. It's just horrible conditions. But in his speeches in Ireland, he never mentioned. Excuse me. He never mentioned. The famine. He never mentioned the conditions in Ireland. He was a very good guest. But when he got to Scotland, he wrote a letter to Garrison back in Boston that they printed in the Liberator. And he talked about what he'd seen. And he wrote a lot. I'm just doing one little piece because it's so graphic and so horrible. The, uh, but he talked about seeing children out in the streets. He went out and saw the huts people were living in on hillsides. You know, he was, uh, he said it was just, he couldn't believe it. And what's so amazing about it is here's an American slave who's been beaten. And he's horrified by what he sees in Ireland. It's hard to imagine what it must have been like. Douglas, excuse me. Douglas wrote, this is February 26, 1846. He wrote, I spent nearly six weeks in Dublin, and the scenes I witnessed were such as to make me blush and hang my head to think myself a man. I speak truly when I say I dreaded to go out of the house. The streets were literally alive with beggars displaying the greatest wretchedness. Some of them mere stumps of men, without feet, without legs, without hands, without arms, and others still more horribly deformed with crooked limbs down upon their hands and knees, their feet lapped around each other and laid upon their backs, pressing their way through the muddy streets and merciless crowd. I mean, it's a horrible scene but it also shows you the brilliance of Douglas as a writer. I mean, he was, he could describe things so graphically. The, uh, the other important thing that happens, I mean, I'll miss these notes up so badly, but when he's in England, he becomes very good friends with, with several, uh, with quite a few Quakers, but these two, two Quaker women became very fond of him and they realized how sad he was. There was just a sort of a sadness pervading him because he hadn't seen his, his family in so long, his, his little children and, and his wife. And also they realized there was a fear there about going back to the United States. So they got together, largely with other Quakers, but others too, abolitionists, and they raised money. And they contacted, they had a lawyer, and he contacted a lawyer in Baltimore, Baltimore 
he contacted Douglas's master and they bought his freedom <laughs> for 150 pounds, which oh. translated as about $711. Mm. And that actually was very controversial back home with other abolitionists. He got attacked for, they say, you, you, you allowed them to put a price on your head, you're just validating slavery, you know, and, <coughs> and Douglas responded, you know, I, I have to think about the safety of my family and the safety of myself, and I want to continue the work I'm doing back in the, in the United States. So uh, he, uh, it, my one, my only discovery in all of this, Mr. Historian here, I'm not, you know, was when Douglas came back, he comes back on, on uh, April 20th, 1847, and he has, there's a party in Lynn, a huge celebration at a hall, there's one in Boston, and uh, there are some other places, but he, but six days after coming home, he buys a house in Lynn, and I think it's the first house he ever bought. I, I, I was going through endlessly the, the, the archives of the uh, Southern Essex Registry of Deed, and I found this recording of Douglas purchasing a house. And uh, what shocked me was, it's a, I know the location, it was a fairly nice house close to the ocean, and it cost $2,200. And I thought, where the heck is he getting $2,200? But he was buying it from a man named James N. Buffum, who he's actually made. He traveled with Douglas the first year Douglas was overseas, and Buffum was a very distinguished Lynn guy. One of the most he built over 400 houses and buildings in Lynn. He developed big parts of the city. He became the mayor, and so he was a man with a lot of money. So I had a feeling something was worked out here where he helped Douglas to get this house. But Douglas also came back. The people in England knew his dream was to start his own newspaper. So they raised more money for him so he could buy a press. And he came home and his, he, he went and talked to Garrison and then the Boston abolitionist said, I want to start my own newspaper right here. And the fact that he bought the house in Lynn indicates to me he planned to start either in Lynn or right in this area. And they said, that's a bad idea. The uh, many, several black newspapers have started, they've all failed. <coughs> we need you more as a speaker. You're valuable as a speaker, not, not as a writer in a newspaper. And they talked him out of his dream. Mm. But that summer, he's traveling, speaking again, and he's in Pittsburgh and, and, <coughs> and uh, meets the editor of a black paper there who convinces him to follow his dream. And another man he meets also convinces him. So secretly, when he comes back home, he doesn't tell the Boston people, <laughs> but he makes plans to go to Rochester, New York, where he has a lot of friends, there are a lot of abolitionists, and that's where he starts the North Star. And he leaves in November of uh, 1847, and I have all these stupid dates in my head, and the first edition of the Liberator is December 3rd, 1847. And then I always wonder what happened to his family, because I knew he left without his family. But he comes back in February of 1848, and he collects his family. And his wife hated to leave Lynn. She hated to leave New Bedford, which had a large black community. She also hated to leave Lynn. It was really tough for her to adjust. And his wife, I haven't said anything about Anna, but she's an amazing person. She was illiterate. Uh, you know, and she's this big woman, and you see, you just, and Douglas is like a movie star, and he's a genius, and he's, so it's hard to picture them together, but the more you read about Anna, and some people, a w woman wrote a book about uh, women in the world of Frederick Douglass, it came out about two years ago, and it's marvelous, and it gives you such a portrait of Anna, what a strong person she was, she, almost like Abigail Adams, she raised those kids on her own, you know, and most of the time, so she was an uh, amazing woman, so the, the, uh, so Lynn, the Lynn years um, are, are important because they're, they're transformative years in Douglas's life. He, uh, he comes to Lynn as a fugitive slave. He leaves a free man. He comes to Lynn unknown. He leads a famous order. And in Lynn, he wrote Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, which the, the Library of Congress recently named it one of the books that shaped America. Hmm. On, that, on that list is Moby Dick and Huckleberry Finn and things like that, so it's, it's a small book, but when you think of a man who, who uh, was, had no education, was punished for learning, did everything on his own, he picked papers up off the street and dried them off and learned to you know, practice reading, and he's an amazing story. So I want to read you one last thing, and then I'll be quiet. The, uh, Douglas gave uh, his most famous one of his most famous speeches. Now, the reason, reason I want to read it is you'll, see, you'll get the full sense, hopefully, of Douglas's brilliance uh, as a public speaker. When he went to Rochester, he was there just a couple of years, and they asked him to deliver the annual Fourth of July address. Mm -hmm. 
and they pack Corinthian Hall, all the dignitaries are there. And Douglas got up and for the first two thirds of it, he praised this country and, and the, the patriots and the revolution who fought for liberty and who cherished freedom. But then he switches right at the end and he said, how can a country that cherishes freedom condone slavery and what happens in slavery, the murders and the rapes and the beatings? So here's the point at which he shifts gears in this, in what's become one of his most famous speeches. It's called The Meaning of July 4th for the Negro, Rochester, New York, July 5th, 1852. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all the other days in the past year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty an untold license, your national greatness swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the United States at this very hour. <laughs> Happy Fourth of July. He didn't ask me, but mm -hmm. it was a, uh, the whole speech, every chance to read it, is really, it's a powerful, powerful mm -hmm. speech and uh, shows you Douglas at his greatest. So anyhow, I was hoping not to go on, but I go on. So I'm, I'm <laughs> over and I, one thing too, believe me, you don't have to at all by this little book. I, I, I bring it with me because there, the citizens of Lynn with no help even from not much from the historical society which has been absorbed into something called the Lynn Museum and Lynn Arts. They all combine together because they're fighting for survival but but several citizens uh, ran Douglas events. They're working now to build a monument and, and do other things to sort of uh, so I, I was able to sell a few hundred copies of this book when I, when I spoke and all the money goes to them. I don't go out and buy dinner with it, so it just goes to them. So, uh, anyway, don't buy it. But I just so if there, are, if there are any questions by anybody about anything, I'll try to answer them. But I can't guarantee I can. I think sure. you answered them. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. How did he arrange the contacts in England and Ireland? How did that even happen? Well, many abolitionists had gone over before. Uh, Garrison had toured there. Uh, even a, a, a black abolitionist had gone there, Charles Lennox Remen from Salem. Hmm. So Douglas was only one in many who'd gone there. And they all had uh, a regular circuit they did, and they had, huh. I mean, he ended up speaking too, but Douglas was different. When he went, word spread so quickly that it was Douglas, that it was, that it was a fugitive slave. He spoke to thousands of people, and you spoke without a, a microphone. Hmm. And you, you, and he spoke sometimes for close to two hours. And Douglas would pace on the stage, and he's this big man, he had this baritone voice, and he would sometimes sing, and he was very funny. He told stories, mocking ministers, and he, he did, he, one story he used to tell was, he would pretend he was in a church, he was the minister pointing up to the balcony where the only place <coughs> the slaves were allowed to sit, and, uh, and he'd give a speech, the, the minister's speech, everyone would be in, laughing uproariously as he went on. <coughs> but, but, he wasn't the first to go, and there was sort of a, there was sort of a circuit the abolitionists spoke on, and a lot of support, a lot of abolitionists and Quakers in, in Great Britain. So, did he have a religious affiliation? He was. He didn't. He was. Uh, uh, he was belonged to the uh, when he was in New Bedford. He joined the African uh, Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, and he became a lay preacher in that church. <laughs> I mean, this again, I say, every time someone heard him speak, they said, okay. And his wife dreamed he would be, remain a preacher and stay in New Bedford. And he goes off on this wild life that uh, was too much for his wife, really. But he, uh, at the end of his uh, narrative, after he says horrible things about ministry, he talks about the end, uh, in a little appendix at the end about his own Christian faith and what a devout Christian he is. He says, we, we are, I'm trying to follow the true, the true, Christianity of Christ, 
not the Christianity that, that exists today in the United States. So it's interesting. Who taught him to read? Who taught him to read? Well, he had a, uh, uh, when he was a slave, he went for a while. He was so, even then, the people realized that. I, I laugh when I read these things. As a little boy in this plantation, he becomes best friends with the Colonel Lloyd's son, who was the head of the, almost the plantation. Now, then they send him to live with a family in Baltimore, <coughs> the, the brother of his master, slave master. He want, they want someone to, to be with their boy there. So they picked him up all the time because he, they realized he was a brilliant little boy. And there, the, uh, the, the brother, the, the wife <coughs> of, of the brother in Baltimore, she was teaching her son to read and write, and she started teaching Douglas and went on for quite a while until her husband discovered it and he went crazy. He said, you can't teach a slave, they'll, then they'll want to they'll learn everything, they'll want to revolt, or whatever. You, it's just, so uh, and he had also, he, he came back to a plantation later and he ran his own Sabbath school, but he also, he would trade uh, whatever he could find with schoolboys he became friends with on the streets and they would give him some of his schoolwork and he'd take that home and privately, <coughs> secretly try to read things. He talked literally about picking up pieces of the Bible from the streets and coming home and drying it off and reading it. So he did have some help, but a lot of it was just, I mean, she gave him a, a, good, a good start, but a lot of it was just him. And when he worked in, a, in the factory in New Bedford, he would pin the newspaper to the wall in front of him and practice reading that while he, so he just mm -hmm. talked about hunger for learning, you know, and I always think of kids who don't want to go to school and you think of what Douglas did to get an education, you know, and he read his whole life. He never stopped. He just devoured things, so. Anyway, yes. The, this is not about uh, Douglas, but um, about a mile and a half up the road is a house that was on the Underground Railroad, wow. and that's been authenticated. But our house here for the Historical Society had, I say had, it's, it's been destroyed because when the fireplaces were rebuilt, the building code said that you had to abide by the current rules. And the main fireplace enclosed a room on the second floor. Oh my goodness. So if you walked in to a closet on the second floor and the, the w closet was nicely wallpapered, and then you pushed the furthest wall strongly enough, you went into a chamber. And that chamber was all painted, mm -hmm. had benches around, would nicely fit about eight people, was all painted, clean as a whistle, and it was surrounded by the chimneys of the three fireplaces on the second floor. So that had to go? And that, that, yes. History, and it was never documented. History lost out to the building code. <laughs> it was never it was shame, documented. No? Yeah. And it's in, in the house right across from here. And that was the house of the first minister to come to this mm. town, 1720. I think slaves learned so where, where the same community I was. am I am assuming that that yep. house was on the Underground it's Railroad, like as was the house Jenkins. a mile yep. and a half Jenkins. up the road. Jenkins, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So that must have that been... That history is right here, right? With the ab abolitionists. <clears throat> well, there were a lot of abolitionists, sir, and people, or at least not, not people like Douglas in that group, but people who just believed in it, believed it was the right thing to do, the Christian thing to do, and a lot of Quakers... Uh, or, or not all of them, but, but a lot were out there. There is a folk tale from a family here in town that Lincoln was speaking at a, a big convention in Lowell. And there was a family that lived here, and their house is still here in town. And, um, and it was abolitionists speaking at this, and a riot broke out, and they. Wow ditched him into the farm wagon and covered him with hay and brought him back down here right. and you know, he hit him out in the house and they got him on the train in the morning and got him out of town that he was um, 
a congressman or some something in politics right. at the time before before he became right. the president. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Of uh, the name of the North Star, his newspaper is that. Am I thinking it that, is, that, right. that it's that there's a reason? They followed the North Star. Followed right? the North yeah. Star, yeah. Right. So, for he, the, he for the that, he, so he took that name. On the way to Canada, uh, right. hopefully to end up in Canada across the border. And uh, that's what Harriet Tubman did time and time again. He uh, kept going back. I can't imagine the courage of people to escape yourself and go back and back to bring people out. Douglas also always said she had more courage than I did, even though he was courageous himself. Mm -hmm. So, so. Do you know if there are any known living descendants? Pardon? Th that's what I was going to ask them. Do you know if there are any living descendants? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No? Yeah. yeah. There's a Douglas Family Association. I met his great 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 grandson. So there's a, they're quite active. And when the events were held in Washington, D.C., they took part in those. And so there are, Douglas says, he had five children. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them, Annie, who was really the star of the family, died at the age of 10. And infant mortality then was so common. Your every letter you'd read, someone would say, "I'll be in your town in two weeks. You know, I'll bring you along." And oh, by the way, Jamie didn't make it. He died last week. You know, you'd read these things about their children. Douglas had about 20 grandchildren. Half of them died. So it's really a, a rugged time to live. It's amazing. So. Anything else? How much is the book? For you, it's $15. <laughs> 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 it's going to say, uh, the society obviously will buy one anyway. Sure, but right. I'll probably buy one. Well, don't worry about that. But I just bring with me more for you to look at. I, I went to an exhibit at the African American Museum in Boston, which is the backside of Beacon Hill. Yeah. And I was surprised to discover that going back 150 years, the, the, the front couple streets were all these dignitaries, Wendell Phillips family, big houses. The whole backside was very poor, all the African American. Slaves actually lived on Beacon Hill. Pardon? Slaves actually lived on Beacon Hill. When they yeah. had, they would do it when these ships came in and they had all the bricks. That's how they did a lot of it, and a lot of the slaves. But don't forget, we were up the north. We weren't as bad as down south. I mean, even today down south, they're not as. No, but Douglas would make the case that it was just about as bad up here. He uh, well, it probably he would, was, but I don't think it could be as bad as down south. I mean, to this day, my girlfriend's family lives down there, and they're still, they're still not that great with the blacks. No, it's true, but you face that everywhere. You told so many stories up here, you know, going into a restaurant in Boston with an abolitionist friend, and as soon as he walked in and sat down, everybody in the restaurant got up and walked up. So yeah, but, uh, my husband's uh, uncle, when he came back from World, uh, the, I think the Korean, World War II, I think it was, and they were down Boston, and they were sitting at a, in the cafeteria. And he met a girl down south, and she came up here with him. And she was horrified to think that this black guy sitting down with them. You know, right. we were equal here compared to down south. So I don't know how bad, I mean, he, this is before what he right. went through. But we weren't as bad here as it was down south. And I still think to this day, I think we're pretty liberal around here. I, we're well. good. I'm not saying all the north is good, but I think we are compared to a lot down south. Yeah. Those southerners, right. just even when the Civil War broke out. I mean, you know, they were this high float with these big plantations. Oh, we're going to end the war in one day. Well, it didn't happen that <laughs> way. And then when the Yanks finally did win, they still had hold it against you to a degree. You know. Uh, both the north and the south were. Uh, well, that's why I'm wicked. I mean, that's why they assassinated the poor guy because that's, he was trying to do the right thing. And he did do the right thing, but not, they didn't all agree. I mean, brother against brother, north against south. You know, it was interesting. When, when Lincoln uh, first got elected, Douglas is the editor of his newspaper, and he ripped Nick Lincoln to pieces time after time. When Lincoln gave his first inaugural address, he said, all I want to do is keep the country together. Right. You can keep your slaves. You can keep slavery. If they escape, we'll enforce the fugitive slave law. We'll send them back. Later on, Lincoln was th said, Blacks and whites cannot live together. So he's for colonization. He wanted to ship them all away. So Douglas went after Lincoln time and time again. But meeting him, he was so impressed by what a decent man he was, he came to realize Lincoln was all, always seemed to be trying to do what would keep the Union together. He later became, and they, they thought in his heart, he really was always an abolitionist, but he, 
He was afraid of losing the border states. There was a lot of things to think about when he had to take positions. So, so it was very complicated, but it was amazing for me to see the relationship they had because Douglas, when Douglas went to, went to uh, see Lincoln for the first time, he was so upset because he'd been pushing for, he kept writing these articles, you're fighting the war with one arm tied behind your back. You won't let the black man fight. Finally, Lincoln did. Douglas recruits for the Mass 54th, two of his boys, the first two he recruits, and he realizes they don't get promotions, they don't get the same pay, and if they're captured, a lot of them are executed you know, in the South. So he goes and storming into the White House, well, maybe, maybe not storming him, but he goes to the White House <laughs> in to see Lincoln, and he walks into the room, and he starts to introduce himself, and Lincoln says, Mr. Douglas, I know who you are. <laughs> you know? But they developed a friendship, you know, where Lincoln called him for advice, uh, once or twice, and they became, when Lincoln gave his second inaugural address, which was a masterpiece, Douglas was in the crowd. Afterwards, a huge reception in the White House, and anybody could line up and go in. And Dinklet, Douglas and a black woman got in line to go in, and when they got to the door, the policemen just took them to the side and said, you can't go in. And so Douglas, someone passed, and he said, could you get word to the president that they're holding me at the, at the door? So very quickly, somebody comes back and says, let him in. So he goes across, and Lincoln's very tall, and all these people are lined up to shake his hand, and Lincoln looks over and says, here comes my friend Douglas. <laughs> and he waves him over, and Douglas uh, uh, goes up, and he, there's so many people waiting, he just wants to shake his hand and move on. And Lincoln says, no, no. He said, I saw you out in the audience. What did you think of my, of my, my speech today, my second inaugural? <laughs> and Douglas said, I thought it was a sacred effort. And it meant a lot to, to Lincoln coming from Douglas, who he was, mm -hmm. what a great speaker he was. and. Uh, so they had an interesting relationship, love-hate, but mainly love, so. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you've been a great audience. Thank and you. I appreciate Thank all you very much. Appreciate all your questions. Thank you. 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 Thank you.